Hi, welcome to Curator's Corner Dead Doubles with Trevor Barnes. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum in Washington, DC. Thank you for joining us on a cold and gloomy day in DC. Spy Museum historian and curator, Dr. Andrew Hammond, will be talking with Mr. Barnes in just a few moments about the case behind Trevor's book, Dead Doubles, The Extraordinary Worldwide Hunt for one of the Cold War's most notorious spy rings. But first, a few words about Trevor. He studied espionage and the early history of the CIA as a student at the University of Cambridge and was a Kennedy Scholar at Harvard. He has worked as a radio and television journalist for the BBC and as a legal consultant. And he is the author of three crime novels. He also researched and wrote Trial at Tehran, a radio play about the trial in Poland of a Secret Service murder case. He's a very fascinating person. And you are going to get to ask him your own questions after Andrew and Trevor talk. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Andrew and Trevor. I'm going to disappear for a few minutes and let you guys take us away. Thanks, Amanda. So I've been really looking forward to this, Trevor, especially after we had such a great chat last week. Um, in, the, in, the, in the museum business, we're in the business of artifacts. And I know that you have a fantastic uh, artifact or prop. Uh, and I was wondering if we could use that to just set the scene a little bit for your book. So I'm referring to your lighter. Sure. Uh, this is the artifact that uh, Andrew was referring to. It's an antique 1960 Ronson cigarette lighter. And this isn't the actual one, of course, that was involved in the case, but it very much helps us, I think, set the prologue and the whole story of the amazing, quite frankly, amazing counter-espionage investigation led by Britain's MI5, that's the UK's domestic security service. Well, why, why is this artifact interesting? Well, it really was the key to the case for MI5, and it emerged in September 1960 because they had at that stage started the case and they had identified a Canadian businessman they thought, who was living under the name of Gordon Lonsdale. And they had trailed Gordon Lonsdale um, around after he'd first been identified in London. And at the end of August 1960, he went to the Midland Bank in the centre of London, quite near where I used to work, first of all, for the BBC at New Broadcasting House. And he went into the bank with three items, three cases, and he came out with nothing. So there was a hurried phone call back to MI5 headquarters in Mayfair saying something's happened. Lonsdale has, you know, disappeared um, um, into the bank with these things and he's come out with nothing. So MI5 said, wow, you know, we need to think about what we do about this. And at the same time, Lonsdale had quite literally vanished. His phones were by that stage being bugged and they overheard that he said he was going off for a few weeks to Canada. So MI5 decided to take the fairly uh, irregular step of going into the safety deposit box in the bank um, where Lonsdale had left these items. And amongst the items which were taken back to the MI5 top secret laboratory near St Paul's Cathedral, at the very end of their search, they came across this. And the man who was the MI5 chief investigator was a man called Charles Elwell, fascinating man. And he said, why on earth would Lonsdale put this cigarette lighter away with other quite sensitive items in the bank? So we asked for it to be put under an X-ray machine, and it was, and it was found that there was a shadow. So they decided to open it up, and the inside was hollow. This is not the original. They saw a piece of green baize, they took it out, and underneath, eureka moment, were three standard KGB issue one-time pads. That's to say the miniaturized encoding pads that were used by CIA agents abroad to take their messages that were written in normal script, plain uh, text, if you like, encode them and then send them by message back to Moscow. And so at that moment, ka-ching, 
MI5 knew that the man they were chasing, Gordon Lonsdale, was actually a secret deep cover KGB illegal agent. That was the hit shot, as they say. That was the moment when the penny dropped. Yeah, they, up to that moment, as I said, had started the case. I mean, it had begun earlier in the year when um, it had ambled along at the beginning. But then there was an amazing breakthrough at the end of April 1960, which came from the CIA. Because one of the other interesting features of the case is the fact that its tentacles genuinely stretch all over the globe. And they are a wonderful illustration of how important the Five Eyes intelligence cooperation was between the major intelligence services of those Five Eyes powers. And it was the Americans who played a key role. And the CIA, at the end of April um, 1960, had for a couple of years had an agent somewhere or other working in Eastern Europe or in Russia. They weren't sure exactly where the person worked, codenamed Sniper. And at the end of April, Sniper had produced top secret intelligence that the CIA passed to MI5, which said in the early uh, 1950s, in 1951, in Warsaw, the Polish capital, in the British naval attache's office, someone got recruited. And that person started to feed information to the Polish intelligence service. This person was then sent back to Britain and is now working actively for the CIA, sorry, for the KGB in uh, the British Admiralty, that's to say, in effect, the Navy in the UK. And this person's name begins with an H, something like Hookkenner. There was only one prime suspect. When MI5 ransacked through the files, they discovered there was this man called Harry Houghton, who had been in the Navy in World War II, came out, and then had gone off to Mont Warsaw. Um, and worked in the British Naval Attaché's office. He'd then come back from the UK. Houghton worked at a place called the Underwater Detection Establishment at Portland, which is on the southwest coast of England. Those uh, viewers who are keen on English literature and are familiar with the novels of Thomas Hardy will no doubt know that Dorset is where Hardy set his great novels. And it's on the coast of Dorset where Portland is based. And it's the Portland there, of course, which gave the name to the Portland spy ring. So MI5 had put Houghton under observation. Houghton had a girlfriend, stroke mistress, although I'm not sure how close and intimate their relations were from looking at the files and the searches that were made and phone calls that were bugged. Um, but anyway, um, they were watched. And that was really what led MI5 to Lonsdale and the cigarette lighter we've talked to, because... Through bugging the phone of Houghton, they discovered that Houghton was coming up to London to meet someone. They didn't know what, how, why, when. At the start of July 1960, MI5 followed Houghton with their team of people that they called the Watchers. In the John le Carré novels, they're called the Lamplighters. And he, Houghton, was seen to meet this mysterious Canadian businessman outside the famous Old Vic Theatre. And there was an exchange of something. They were too far away to see what it was. And that was what put Lonsdale onto the radar screen of MI5. OK, we'll, we'll explore the cast of characters a little bit more in a few moments. But before we get there, um, here in the United States, uh, Larry King sadly passed away recently. Um, and he was famous in his interviews for having never read the book of the person that was on so that he could put himself in the shoes of the viewers and the listeners. I have read your book, but I'm going to pretend I haven't. So tell us a little bit more about why this case matters. What was the underwater defense establishment? Why did the CIA care? Why did this have global tentacles? So just help us understand the stakes and, and what was involved. Well, we've got to cast our minds back to the Cold War and the fact that the intelligence war between the Soviet bloc and the West was, in effect, a substitute for hot war. Fortunately, during the Cold War, the only really extended hot war was in Korea at the early 50s. But Russia was hermetically, uh, the Soviet Union, hermetically sealed off. I mean, Putin's Russia had, has nothing on what the Soviet Union was like. And so the West were quite paranoid because, of course, they knew by this stage 
uh, the 1950s that Russia had nuclear weapons. So it's crucial that um, they knew everything about uh, Russia. And it's equally crucial that Russia learned everything they could about the West. Now, Russia from the mid 50s um, and the 1956 in particular, when Khrushchev um, took over at the head of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, wanted to build up their navy. It uh, wanted, uh, Khrushchev was obsessed by submarines. And of course, the cheapest way of them developing their navy, and in particular, building their first nuclear submarine and making sure that it had the very best sonar was to spy on the West. They'd learnt this lesson from Los Alamos and stealing the secrets of the first atomic bomb. So Britain and NATO had based a large part, the most important part of all their underwater um, submarine and torpedo research down at Portland. Britain at the time was world leading in this area along with the US. Britain was building its first nuclear submarine called Dreadnought and Britain had developed a world beating nuclear submarine sonar called Type 2001. But of course also down in, in uh, Portland were other really important secrets of interest to the Russians. Um, the Brits were sending their submarines out on very, very sensitive missions to try and breach the, uh, the submarine defences of the Soviet Union to collect information, incredibly dangerous, highly secret missions. Um, and of course, the Russians wanted to know what was going on with those. And so Portland was a really important target for the KGB in the 1950s. But also, I mean, Britain generally was. And so what the KGB decided to do was set up a network of spies. And as a number of your our viewers of this event know, um, Russia has always really run two groups of spies, the legal ones working out of embassies and the illegal ones who were living under deep cover. Most uh, recently, of course, uh, exposed in, in the States because they still go on with Operation Ghost Stories. And so this case matters because it's a wonderful miniature of the way in which the KGB was wanting wherever possible to set up networks of illegal spies in the West in order for them to steal really, really important secrets that would save immense numbers of rubles and time for the Russian defence establishment. And, and just really briefly, could you tell us in 1960, what was Britain's nuclear deterrent? Was it all based in submarines or was it also an aircraft or were there a variety of different platforms? Well, it was broadly um, on aeroplanes, but also the beginnings of um, submarines. You've got to bear in mind that America had the world's first nuclear submarine, USS Nautilus, and the US were sharing the technology of the engine with Britain, although it was far from straightforward, as Peter Hennessy's uh, marvellous book about the development of um, the Britain's submarine fleet after World War II shows. But that was shared with Britain. And so there was no yet, there was no British nuclear deterrent at that stage. Um, so it was on aircraft. Um, there were suggestions that Britain would develop some rockets, some medium range nuclear weapons that could be deployed in Europe. But this was a subject of great sensitivity. Um, the new president of the United States, J.F. Kennedy, um, was engaged in uh, talks involving his administration to see what might happen. Uh, but it was a very, very sensitive area, um, as indeed some documents just released by the US National Security Archive shows. So um, it were, we were very, very close to having the start of the nuclear submarine deterrent. But in Britain's case, it was all on the aircraft at the time. OK, thank you. Um, I think the next thing that would be helpful would be just tell us the the dramatis personae, who are the, who are the main characters involved? Who was in the Portland spy ring? I believe that there were a number of different nationalities and different and rather interesting characters involved. There were, I mean, one of the fun things about researching and then writing the novel, or rather writing the history, it was that it did resemble a novel, trying to uh, find out and then represent the different characters of the five spies. 
and their motivations. There were indeed five spies, so I've already talked about Gordon Lonsdale, the Canadian businessman, as he appeared to be, who was masquerading as a jukebox salesman. Then there were the two British people. There was Harry Houghton, uh, by this stage uh, in his uh, early 50s. And he had his girlfriend, Ethel G, who was in her mid-40s. She was unmarried. She lived with her elderly mother. Rather surprising, I discovered from the files, um, even sharing a bedroom with her mother, which must have been quite tough for a woman in her late 40s, and also two other elderly relatives, leading a very uh, restricted life, so that when Houghton, who had split up from his wife, and there's a story there, by the way, about the relationship between Harry Houghton and his wife, since the wife uh, provided useful uh, information to MI5 about Harry Houghton, um, and he then turned his attentions to Ethel G. She obviously had her head turned relatively easily. But the final two characters in the ring um, only emerged towards the end of 1960 because when Gordon Lonsdale returned from his trip abroad, this was after the cigarette lighter had been discovered and MI5 had done more research on Lonsdale. Lonsdale returned to a very, very uh, well-appointed, i.e. it was near Regent's Park in London, but small flat. Uh, but he didn't stay there. Every night he used to travel out west um, from London and he was followed further and further by the watchers until he disappeared one night into um, a small road in the northwest London suburb of Ryslip, which had nothing remarkable about it at all, apart from the fact that it wasn't remarkable. A sleepy suburb, dormitory area for central London. And MI5 had no idea where he'd gone. They couldn't follow him into the road because the people who were trailing Lonsdale were afraid of being spotted. So MI5 set up an observation post and a few days later they spotted from the observation post that was in a neighbour's house. Um, um, they saw Lonsdale emerge from the front door of a bungalow opposite number 45 Cranley Drive and it was there that lived a man called um, Peter Kroger and his wife Helen Kroger and Peter Kroger at the time um, seemed to be an antiquarian bookseller. So this was where Lonsdale was disappearing to, and that makes up the five spies. Um, when MI5 did their initial inquiries, they were told by neighbours that the Krogers were Canadian, but in fact it turned out that they had New Zealand passports. So again, you can see how um, we've got Canada, we've got New Zealand, we've got the US, um, and that's without you know, what was going on in Europe as well and cooperation from the European intelligence agencies. So those are the five spies. And, are, and is it one of those five spies that's on the, the cover of your book? Sorry, I missed that. Is it one of those five spies that is on the cover of your book? Yes, yeah, sorry, yes, yes. On the cover of the book is um, Gordon Lonsdale. And you can see that um, he's in front of the Houses of Parliament. Um, in this case, this is a picture of Lonsdale after he had been um, sent to jail in Britain. We'll talk about that in a moment if you want the trial. And he uh, was the subject of a spy swap. And uh, that particular photograph, in fact, wasn't taken in London. It was taken in either Russia or in East Germany after his release. So that's that's him looking typically Russian in one of those wonderful Russian hats. And in part of the research for our conversation, I went to the MI5 website and they, I'm going to quote it here, they say this marked one of the service's most significant uh, post-war espionage successes, but some other people think it was a little bit more Keystone Cops. How do you view MI5's uh, counterintelligence operation against this spy ring? I don't think it's fair to describe it as a Keystone Cops operation. Um, it, it, from my point of view, I think it was bearing in mind the limited technologies that were available at the time. And the fact that a successful counter espionage operation relies on careful detective work by the counter espionage agents, as well as good cooperation with police services, 
certainly in the UK, when you need to arrest the people. It did all work out incredibly well. And bear in mind how difficult it is to um, track down KGB illegals. The final result was, I think it's fair to say, a resounding um, success. Um, that's not saying that everything was absolutely perfect because there were a number of flies in the ointment. There was an absolutely fascinating top secret inquiry into lessons that could be learned from this case afterwards. And the uh, transcripts of the evidence given to that top secret inquiry controlled by a retired former judge called the Roma inquiry are in fact in the British archives. And it's fascinating to read word by word the evidence from the head of MI5, Sir Roger Hollis, evidence from a senior figure from Britain's equivalent of the NSA, um, a man called Arthur Bill Bonsall, that organisation is called GCHQ. They played a key role that wasn't known at all as well until the files came out, and, and I described it in my book, to, to a very great extent anyway, because GCHQ were involved in intercepting and then decrypting the radio messages of Gordon Lonsdale from his flat in Regent's Park, um, which was no mean feat. But what was uh, the principal fly in the ointment? Well, the principal fly in the ointment was that it turned out that MI5, in theory at least, could have arrested Harry Houghton years earlier, because I talked earlier about Harry Houghton's former wife. Back in 1956, when their marriage was uh, on the rocks and they were unhappy together, the former Mrs Houghton had gone to the Admiralty Police and reported the fact that Houghton had the habit of taking out of Portland without permission from the research establishment a number of secret documents and then disappearing up to London and then coming back with sheaths of pound notes uh, and then getting drunk. And this was reported to the Admiralty Police down in Portland. They in turn um, had a, uh, I'd say, pretty feeble investigation into Houghton. But this is the main point for MI5. They sent the, uh, the papers up to MI5 asking if MI5 had any record of Houghton, but saying that they felt that these allegations, they, the Admiralty, they couched it in terms of saying that we think these allegations are those of a scorned woman. And the um, request for a check in the MI5 registry came into a junior officer, a most unfortunate one, as it turned out. And MI5 did not have any record of Houghton. So this uh, young officer wrote back saying we've got no record. On the face of it, this is a really silly thing and most completely inappropriate, um, we tend to agree with you that these are the allegations of a scorned woman. He had no basis whatsoever to write that. And uh, there was a um, considerable number of red faces in MI5 when this emerged. But as the number two at MI5, no less, said um, in a memo at the time, yes, we could in theory have caught him back in 1956. But of course, if we had, we wouldn't have caught the other members of the ring, in particular the Krogers, who turned out, once they'd been captured, to be far, far, far bigger fish that MI5 knew at the time they were arrested on the 7th of January 1961. So ju just to dig into each of those characters a little bit more, uh, Trevor, for Harry uh, Houghton, what was his motivation? So for espionage in the museum, we talk about the mice, uh, money, ideology, uh, coercion, or um, ego, which which one of them was I, was Harry Houghton involved in, or was it something else? I think it was the M and it was the E, uh, Andrew. It was definitely money, um, and you know he, he was, you know, motivated. I think by desire um, to get some money from the Soviet uh, secret service, but he also had this massive chip on his shoulder. He, it turned out from documents released by the KGB in the 1990s, during the short, very short period when um, a number of documents from the, end, uh, the KGB archives were released and were available to the West. He had offered his services himself to uh, the, the Polish intelligence service. And this was because he felt that he was badly treated in Warsaw compared with people of a higher social class, who were given better accommodation, 
who are given better allowances and so on and so forth. There's also one record in the KGB files that he uttered at one point some resentment against American influence in Europe and Britain. But he was certainly uh, not interested in ideology. He wasn't um, like George Blake, for example, who, who died on Boxing Day in, in Moscow, or Kim Philby and the other members of the so-called Magnificent Five KGB spies. But I think Ego E at the end of the MIC, he also played a role. He did have an ego, and I think he felt he wasn't treated properly um, by his superiors, and he did like to show off to the people around him, um, shown by way of example in the trial when he started to tell um, stories about why he said he'd started spying, in other words, the alleged duress. And you felt he was almost standing at the saloon bar in his local public house, regaling people with stories um, of his time in the Navy and trying to impress them. And that's a symbol, I think, of uh, someone with a, an ego which he'd like to have flattered. And, and just turning our attention to Gordon Lonsdale, uh, Colin Molody, I recently uh, reread Yuri Moden, the controller of the Cambridge Five. I recently reread his memoir. And it seems to me that, you know, in the opening chapters of your book, you talk about how the Portland spy ring was rolled up. But it seems to me that Gordon Lonsdale's tradecraft wasn't quite as. Um, quite as uh, refined or as um, he wasn't quite as careful as, as say someone like Yuri Moden. So in the book, you talk about how, you know, MI5 have people in a cafe listening into like a phone call between Lonsdale and, and Harry. Um, what, what's your kind of view on that? Well, I think that, uh, and just to be clear, by the way, um, Gordon Lonsdale's real name was Conon Trofimovich Molody as, as Andrew said he wasn't identified actually until after the trial in March 1961 and the FBI in particular had carried out some very very impressive detective work in California of all places and this identified that Molody had gone to California in his teenage years to stay with an aunt and this is how he'd learned fluent English but going back to the issue of his tradecraft um, I think it's always easy to criticise um, an agent who is caught, um, but we have to, uh, you know, bear in mind that, you know, various things could have gone wrong. My impression from reading it all was that, on the whole, uh, Molody was a, a, a very, very good illegal agent, and indeed, regularly in the MI5 files, you all read um, praise for him by the people who are following him, saying how careful he is watching uh, behind him, ensuring he's not being tailed, um, you know, taking relevant precautions that he would have been taught when he went to the KGB Academy to learn his, his craft. Um, he was very, very charming. He did set up and did run a pretty effective network that certainly, in my view, based on all the research I've pulled together, stretched beyond Harry Houghton and Ethel G to include other spies whose real names have not yet emerged. And uh, I think some valuable intelligence was, was garnered from, for example, Port and Down, the chemical and biological center that Britain runs, um, getting, for example, the secret of CS gas that had been newly synthesized and even quite possibly, I think, some of the early nerve agents that were developed down in the early 50s in Port and Down, which led in turn eventually to, to Novichok. Um, but of course, I mean, as I said, he was caught. Um, it is possible that, as uh, Gordon Lonsdale, Colin Mollady said to MI5 when he was talking to them while he was in prison, um, he, he said, well, I, I knew that someone had been interfering with the items in my safety deposit box. Who can tell? All we know was that he, Conor Mollady, stayed in London. I did hear some 
stories from Soviet sources that Molody had alerted Moscow Center to the fact that he felt that he was under observation and that he um, was even possibly on the verge, so one uh, source told me, of being exfiltrated. But I frankly put more trust in the uh, meeting I had with a former senior KGB man called Mikhail Lubimov, who was a contemporary of Oleg Gordievsky, and I met him in Moscow. And when I put these stories to Yubimov, who came across as pretty convincing, I must say, he, he just said, look, you know, first of all, uh, Molody would not at all have gone to that final meeting um, to meet two of his agents, i.e. Houghton and G, if he had even the faintest idea that he was being followed and those people might be compromised. He said that would just be a complete breach of all the rules that those people were taught in the Red Banner training school. He said, you just don't do that sort of thing. I think far more likely was that he may have had some suspicions um, that he was being watched and that he was taking more and more care of what was going on. But MI5 in those final weeks did also step back. You could see in those final weeks and months how they were very nervous about alerting him and of course the Krogers to what was going on. Um, so I think it's a little unfair to criticise him too um, toughly. Having said that, as I said, if ever you were caught, it's always possible to say, well, that person with benefit of hindsight should realise what was going on. And I mean, it comes at quite an interesting time. So earlier in the 50s, uh, Burgess and McLean defect to the Soviet Union. There's rumours of a third man not long after the Portland spy ring that is revealed to be Kim Philby. What, what was the view within the British intelligence establishment when we found out that all of this was going on? Was it, oh my goodness, we, we're going to have some tough phone calls with our American counterparts now? Uh, tell us a little bit more about that Anglo-American relationship at that period of time, or, or was it made more palatable by the fact that a couple of Americans were involved in the spy ring? Well, I, I think it's all of those factors, really. I mean, the links between the CIA, FBI, and um, the British services were always very good. But clearly, um, I think it's fair to say, um, as the CIA and FBI became more and more powerful with more and more resources, uh, the British services made it a point of reaching out and offering as much help as they could to, um, frankly, the better resourced and, and more powerful intelligence agencies. But there was, in fact, great praise from America um, for um, Britain and the intelligence services after the revelation of the Portland spying, And within a matter of weeks, the highly embarrassing revelation about George Blake. You've got to bear in mind, he confessed only a few weeks after the end of the successful trial of the Portland spying, And you see, the Americans were not least grateful for the British intelligence services were rolling up the Portland spying because I said that the identities of the Krogers were, were not known um, when they were arrested. And indeed, that was the case. The Krogers refused to give their fingerprints over to MI5. So an order from the court had to be sought to get those fingerprints, which were duly taken a couple of days after the arrest. Um, those prints were taken back to Scotland Yard. And there was this uh, another, indeed, eureka moment back in the fingerprints department when it was found that there was a perfect match between those of Peter and Helen Kroger and the prints of two long term KGB spies, Morris and Lona Cohen, which the FBI had circulated all around the world at the beginning of 1958 um, because they've been searching for them since 1953. So here were two spies caught. In, in the net totally unexpectedly, which the Americans would not have known about and seen and they hoped had access to if the British had not run this case so effectively. But having said that, um, there were um, after, because uh, there were a series of spy scandals in the early 1950s, after the, um, how should we say, generous approach that the Americans had to the uh, arrest of the Portland spying and the confession of, of, of George Blake, 
there was this wonderful quote from um, even uh, John J. Edgar Hoover, who was not always um, as fond of um, helping the British as some of his um, other intelligence colleagues, saying something like, that, you know, even Jesus had um, had Judas had one traitor in his in his circle of disciples, and uh, you have to kind of forgive that. So that that was a generous approach at the time. But within a, a couple of years, the rumours started to develop and flow around of high-level penetration of British intelligence that were fostered by a small group of renegade officers, in particular an MI5. Chief among them was a man called Peter Wright, whose book Spycatcher was finally published. And he, that book, by the way, contains an account of the Portland spy ring because uh, Wright had a relatively minor role in it, confirmed in the files, but if you read Spycatcher, um, he very much presents himself as a, as a key luminary in this successful counter-espionage um, investigation. Um, and, and also uh, an, another confederate of um, Peter Wright was a man called Arthur Martin, who was convinced that there was high-level penetration of MI5. Martin was a highly intelligent, capable man who was privy to the Venona decrypts. These were the remarkable series of intercepts that were made uh, and then decrypted after World War II by the American authorities that gave an insight into KGB espionage um, during World War II and, and before in, in America. So Martin was more aware than most of Soviet penetration. And anyway, um, this group of officers First of all, accused number two at MI5, Graham Mitchell, and then other people. And it, a kind of paranoia developed uh, within MI5. And this then spread across to America. Undoubtedly, that did erode and undermine um, relationships. And also, you had James Jesus Angleton within the CIA. He was also, um, uh, you know, well known as um, seeing reds under every possible bed and uh, was, was also slightly paranoid. And he then sided to some extent with these group of officers in the UK. So if you like, Portland Spiring, George Blake, um, successors from a certain point of view, particularly the Portland Spiring, which was a, um, a really successful counter-espionage operation, but also revealing downsides and vulnerabilities in, in British institutions and intelligence services. 1961... 62 was a period when the Americans were still going along with it, but pretty soon things got rather sour. So that helps put it in perspective a little bit, I think. Thank you. That's really helpful. And tell us a little bit more about how this all plays out, Trevor. Tell us a little bit more about the trial, about the future of Colin Molody, Gordon Lonsdale, Houghton, the Krogers. Give, give us the, the, the part beyond your book. How does this all play out? Well, one of the fascinating things about writing the book is the fact you've got this wonderful narrative arc, which starts from the very first clue, taking you through the investigation, through to the uh, arrests that I've talking about, spoken about. And then you have the trial in March 1961, made headlines around the world. Uh, the five spies were indicted. Uh, interestingly, the um, Coens were indicted in their false names. Clearly, um, the British authorities were very concerned that the jury would be prejudiced if they knew that these two spies uh, were actually Morris and Lona Cohen and the FBI had been looking for them for ages. Um, they were all found guilty, all sentenced to what at the time seemed very, very long periods in prison. Uh, Lord Lonsdale got 25 years, the Krogers each got 20, and Houghton and G got 15. So all sent to jail. Interesting, fascinating interlude followed whereby MI5 uh, started negotiations with uh, Lonsdale, identified within months as uh, Colin Mulledy, to see if they could turn him or get him to, uh, in exchange for a reduction in his sentence, to pass over secrets. But in the end, the British could not offer a sufficiently big reduction in his sentence fast enough for uh, Colin Mulledy to bite. And so um, those negotiations petered out. And the next important stage was the spy swap. Uh, you've got to bear in mind that the first Cold War spy swap, the, the model for this, if you like, was the famous one 
um, involving Francis Gary Powers and Rudolf Abel in 1962. But in 1964, uh, the Russians had managed to arrest a man called Greville Wynne, who was an MI6 courier, and they had a big show trial. He was sent to jail. His health started to deteriorate. They, the Russians, finally had um, a decent uh, piece on the international spy chessboard. So there was a spy swap, and this happened in Berlin in April 1964. Um, Lonsdale, uh, real name Connor Mullady, was swapped for Greville Wynn. But the Krokers had to wait for another five years before there was a spy swap which could enable them to get out of jail. And this was um, engineered um, quite shamelessly by the Russians. Clearly, I think they were running out of patience. Um, they wanted to spring uh, the Cohens, who were um, very valuable agents of theirs. And of course, there's always a strong message the KGB wanted to send out, which is that we will do everything we can to get you out of jail. Of course, in Blake, in George Blake's case, he got out because of a completely bizarre set of circumstances um, and appalling security lapses at Wormwood Scrubs Prison. So he, he himself broke out with the help of some other inmates, but that was a complete exception. And so the Russians um, basically set up um, an innocent, or pretty innocent British man called Ted Gerald Brook, and there was a spy swap um, organised in 1969, and the Cohens went back. But once they all went back, uh, the process of turning them into spy icons started, and uh, certainly under Vladimir Putin, this process of lionising and praising spies as somehow or other heroes of modern Russia um, has found great heroes in um, the, uh, the, the Cohens and indeed Molody. Um, only a, a year or so ago, I went to Moscow and um, didn't see it myself, but there was an exhibition of golden spies of the, of the Soviet Union, which was opened by no less a person than the head of the modern um, uh, foreign bit of the KGB called the SBR, called um, Sergei Narishkin. Um, he wrote a, a photograph and the introduction he wrote to this a spy exhibition. And when people went to it, um, they found pictures, um, no less uh, in pride of place, of um, Morris and Lona Cohen. So they, and also Conlon Molody, um, who's been described as a, as a legend by Vladimir Putin, are praised, they're put on a pedestal by um, the modern Russian authorities. And I believe in one of your trips to Russia, you got a goodie bag, you got you got some swag. <laughs> yeah, yes, I, <laughs> I thought I would try and uh, see if I can get anything um, useful in terms of archives from uh, the modern Russian intelligence service. So I approached the SVR. I did indeed get given by the head of the SVR this, this goodie bag. Um, that building is the press office of the SVR, which is next to uh, the Culture Park Metro Station. And I was given that by a very charming, I have to say, um, head of the press bureau. And the pride of place was this, this bottle of vodka, um, SVR vodka, with the logo of the SVR on one side. And on the back, um, you've got a, a picture of their headquarters on the outskirts of Moscow. You probably just see it there. Uh, yes, the neighbor. So, um, needless to say, I, I, I got um, some cooperation, but it was very, very limited indeed, really uh, confined to some fascinating conversations and uh, um, some photographs, including a, a photograph of the top forger, um, Pavel Gromushkin, who forged the Cohen's documents when they fled from the US in 1950. So fascinating visit and very instructive in some ways about the way in which, as I said, um, the SVR and the FSB and the modern intelligence apparatus in Russia um, are being used as a way of telling um, and uh, making, uh, telling out the modern historical story of Russia as Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin would like it to be seen. And I think uh, another thing that I found quite interesting was you mentioned that you know this the Russian espionage services and like modern Russia play a really 
interesting role um, and play a really uh, sort of central part of that unfolding historical panorama. And I think I was just wondering if you could just flesh that out a little bit more for us. I know that you shared with me that you've you've thought quite a bit about this, um, even, even in terms of a document that you showed me that was uh, given to you from the Second World War. Uh, in, indeed, uh, this was given to me and I found it a real surprise. Um, in the goodie bag, because I, I was expecting, well, not expecting, but uh, um, cause, because MI6 doesn't have a press bureau and certainly doesn't give out bottles of Scottish whiskey to inquiring journalists, as far as I'm aware. But in the uh, the bag was um, a um, top secret document from World War II. Um, I'll show you. It's called Operation Unthinkable. And this turned out to be a genuine document. When I first got it, I thought it might have been an active measure uh, put out by the Soviet Union. And what it is was um, a document as part of a series that were commissioned by Winston Churchill, just as the war in Europe it dates from May 1945. And I say it was called Operation Unthinkable. And what it was was that the Prime Minister Churchill wanted, in a rather typical Churchillian way, to get his team to think the unthinkable about options with the end of World War II. Because Churchill already I, and typically was thinking towards the horizon. And one of the papers, um, the one that was copied and given to me by the head of the SVR Press Bureau, um, said one option would be for the British Armed Forces to link up with the um, Americans in Europe and the um, the remnants of the German army and invade Russia because obviously they was felt that there was to be a threat. Now what was remarkable about this was that this document dates from 1945 but anyone who knows uh, modern Russia well and talks to people um, are aware of the fact that there is this paranoia still in um, certain circles in Russia about the West intentions. And this was brought home to me actually recently by a translation of an interview with the former head of the illegals department of the KGB, called Yuri Drozdov, um, who was close to Putin actually, and, and spent time in Germany when, when Putin was there based at Dresden. And in this interview, Drozdov said, the thing you have to realize is Russia has no friends. People may pretend to be friends of Russia, but actually they always have a hidden agenda. And this document, um, you will find, as I say, I found interestingly given to me um, by the head of the SVR Press Bureau as a symbol, really, of the way in which even in modern Russia today, they are thinking the worst of the West intentions. And this document is also, I uh, learned, in the secret museum of Soviet military intelligence in their new headquarters in Moscow. Um, they, they have a secret museum in the same way the SVR does of you know, great spying exploits. And um, I saw in a Russian documentary that this same document is there. So that's obviously used as a part of, of, of indoctrinating new intelligence officers who come into the GRU into the uh, perfidy of the West. Always be alert, always think the worst of the West intentions. Well, I've really enjoyed our discussion, but I want to hand it over to uh, listeners and viewers for questions um, and I would encourage you to buy the book it's really a great read and it's available from our bookstore so over to Amanda. All right well we have lots of questions including some of our own like I did have a copy of the book but I actually gave it away as a prize for our spy trivia oh. <laughs> the night before I got to read it and so I can't look up the spelling of the spy Houghton, and I want to know if it's a relative of our former historian, Vince Houghton. Andrew, did you have any thoughts about that? Is it uh, a different spelling? I, would, I, would, I think it's the same spelling, it's but it's I'm not the sure same. if they're related. I it's just the same added. spelling, but I'm 100% convinced um, Vince uh, is no relative of Harry Houghton. 
Okay, just had to ask, I wanna applaud you for all the glorious props, which you surprised us with, you told me about them and it was really, really fun to see them. So thank you um, so much. And um, we have a question about the Coens um, that came in last week, someone who was really excited, understanding that they were, you know, canonized and, you know, put on a pedestal. But um, what happened to them in their day-to-day -day life? If, were they trusted? Was there a sense that they had been about to flip um, to MI5? Or how did their real day-to-day -day life as non-spy icons go? Well, life for them was really pretty difficult because uh, Lona Cohen had a go at learning Russian, but never really mastered the language. Um, her husband, uh, Morris Cohen, never really got very far at all. So they lived pretty isolated lives. And the KGB were very keen. This emerges in a, a marvellous book called the Matrokin Archive, which pulls together material brought out of the KGB archives by their former archivist, Vasily Matrokin. And the KGB were monitoring them all the time and very keen that they didn't meet other Western um, spies who had been repatriated to Moscow and so um, th their main time was spent in their flat but they were used very actively um, after um, a couple of years undoubtedly the KGB did check them out to ensure that from what they could gather um, the Coens had not at any point compromised themselves which indeed they had not um, if you read the MI5 files um, when they were in jail and MI5 did have some potentially quite compromising conversations with uh, Connor Mollady, but um, Morris Cohen in particular was a diehard, ideologically committed communist. He was having no truck at all with talking to the Western intelligence services. Um, so once they've been checked out, they actually helped the KGB a lot uh, with training, um, perfecting people's knowledge of English before they were sent out as illegals to live under deep cover. Um, and in fact, Jack Barsky in his recent book gives a fascinating account where, you know, he's met and spent some time with, with Morris Cohen. But by the end, of course, as their health deteriorated, um, they became more and more isolated. Um, one moving moment for me in the book, although I have no sympathy, of course, for, at all for the Coens um, betraying the West, was the fact that Lona Cohen had not seen any of her relatives for decades. And she'd not seen her sister for many, many decades in particular. And just as she was about to die in 1991, the KGB pulled some strings and her only sister was brought to Moscow. And they were reunited um, in the ward where Lona Cohen was dying. And they, they did look at some photographs together. Um, whereas, I mean, Morris Cohen, he survived over a, for a few years, but he was devastated by her death. A Soviet source told me that he even kept his wife's slippers under the bed. Um, he, he just, you know, they were, and I think this was encouraged by their secret life. They were intimately connected as, as, as friends, uh, as well as a married couple. They, they were inseparable. Um, what you had mentioned uh, the trading um, for Gravel Wynn. Wolfgang Vogels at, at, at hard at work on his spy swaps. Uh, one of our guests had had asked about the comments that Greville Wynn made about Lonsdale or this case. And I don't know what that means, so I'm relaying the message. Um, I'm afraid I, I hold up my hand and uh, I'm ignorant. I'm afraid I'm not sure what what Wynn commented about because he, he, he never met him at any point and so i i i really don't know i mean wind was fortunate wind health was deteriorating pretty rapidly and the kgb and the russian authorities were very adept at using active measures to manipulate british uh, opinion through the newspapers in terms of um giving publicity to the worries of understandable worries of rebel winds wife that he might die in, die in jail. But I'm afraid I can't comment on, on what Wynne said, unless someone can tell me. Well, I'll, I'll watch the chat and, uh, and see if it comes through or if it comes through later. 
Um, we're also intrigued by Lonsdale's cover as a jukebox salesman. <laughs> and that really caught the fancy. Um, and uh, wondering how deep did he go? Was he actually selling jukeboxes? We have a favorite spy in the museum, Bistro Leotov, who really lived his cover. If you sold herring, you smelled like herring. Did, um, did Lonsdale know his jukeboxes? Well, I think he was pretty good. He was not actually the great successful businessman which he presented himself as when he got back to Moscow. He was, by all accounts, a great tale teller. He also had quite an ego. Um, to match that of Harry Houghton. Uh, he was a charming individual who, um, by way of example, after he was arrested, um, he refused to say anything to the, uh, the police people who arrested him. Um, and um, he, he sat there stony-faced, but he, th he then said, um, is there any chance of me passing the time by you finding someone who I can play chess with? And um, the, the chief superintendent or superintendent had arrested him and was so charmed by him that he went and found one of the other police officers in Scotland Yard who played chess with um, Gordon Lonsdale. So in terms of his cover, when he first came to Britain, he came under the cover of being a student to study Chinese. And there are a couple of reasons for this. One was he already knew Chinese because he had studied it in Moscow after World War II, and he'd even co-authored um, a standard textbook on the Chinese language. So of course, it meant that when he arrived in London to study at the School of um, Oriental and African Studies, um, he would absolutely walk all the exams and could spend his time developing his network. But also he knew that this course would be the one where a number of Western intelligence agencies would send people who were trainees, who might be, for example, you know, learning Chinese in order to target what was going on in China. And indeed, this was the case. And it led to uh, Mollady taking a series of photographs at parties and other things where these um, uh, fellows have went. And it even led to an absolutely amazing historical example, um, probably the only one in history, where a person who is a KGB spy is being hunted by a counterintelligence officer. And he takes a photograph of the counterintelligence officer um, without him knowing it. And this happened in this case, because when he was a student um, studying Chinese, Lonsdale was invited to a party by one of a Canadian who was on the same Chinese course. And this Canadian happened to be renting a flat at the back of the house lived in by the man called Charles Elwell at the time, who was the head investigator of the Portland spy ring. And when this photo was found, actually, with the cigarette lighter that I've already shown you, it did lead to Elwell being called in to the office of the number two of MI5. That's a bad they, day at work. They thought, God, we've got another, we have got a mole in MI5. But in fact, there was a, an innocent explanation which um, uh, was, was quickly produced and say that was, that was the end of that. But, um, um, but having finished his studies as a Chinese, he then flipped across and he, he then started this jukebox business. And, and by all accounts, he was very good. Um, well, one of his, uh, this would be interesting to the American viewers, one of the jukeboxes was called the Trump. And its special feature was that it dispensed, this also fits in probably with Trump, it dispensed bubble gum at the same time as it, as it played um, a jukebox record. Um, but he wasn't very successful. That business went bust. And uh, he then joined a company that was making an early security device for cars to stop cars being broken into. And there's again a, a photograph in the files of Mollody going to Brussels because this security device was given a special inventors award. So he did live his cover, but he did also take advantage of it to have a good time. Um, he, he did have a number of girlfriends, but again, he wasn't the great um, Casanova successful seducer, which he told the his KGB friends when he went back to Moscow. Well, and one of one of our uh, guests um, man, mentioned a James Mason film from 1960, from the 60s about the case. Uh, if anybody needs any any viewing, are you familiar with that film? Um, I'm not familiar with that one. I'm familiar with um, a couple of pieces of uh, audiovisual material. <laughs> he says, uh, as a former regulator for the, the British TV and media regulator. 
One um, is a wonderful period piece called Ring of Spies that was uh, made in 1963 and put it to cinematic release, um, which tells the story of the Portland spy ring quite well. Um, one historical curiosity is that the man who plays Harry Houser is slightly miscast. He's a great actor called Bernard Lee. So here in the Ring of Spies, he's playing a baddie, a KGB spy. Bernard Lee was no less the, than the actor who played M, the head of the British Secret Service in all the early James Bond films. So people who like old film history might find that of interest. And also the other thing I found in the American archives in DC was this marvelous um, film, also 1963, made by the US Defense Department, which is very historically accurate with some fantastic reconstructions of the um, arrest, for example, certain incidents in the investigation. And it's also of interest to the spy historian because uh, it was filmed in a number of locations, pretty much well, in the locations where the investigation took place, um, but um, shows you what they were like at the time. So really, really unique footage. Well, we could go on, and I'm sorry that we cannot, but we can certainly recommend that people don't give your book away to people who win trivia <laughs> and instead buy your book and read it. And I just can't thank you enough, Trevor, for being with us and Andrew for asking such great and juicy questions. Um, it's really, really a pleasure. And we'll share the questions that we got with Trevor in case he wants to to reach out if he's got any time at all. And I want to invite you to everyone who's watching. We have a program at, um, at noon Eastern on Wednesday, and we will be having a real exploration of Adolf Tolkachev, well, Burton Gerber, which is a real treat. He was uh, station chief in Moscow and um, David Hoffman, who wrote The Billion Dollar Spy about Tolkachev. So we are really looking at um, some serious spies this week. And Trevor, thanks for kicking that week off with this wild Portland spy ring. It really has been a pleasure. And your props were amazing. Well, I'll certainly put that event in my diary. And uh, thank you very much to everyone for watching and to Andrew for asking such great questions and to the Spy Museum and you, Amanda, for hosting. Goodbye from London. The, the one question I wanted to ask but never got around to was, do you have any secrets in the bottom of your later? But we can, we can pick that one up another time. <laughs> I would love to know. <laughs> Thanks so much. Everyone be well. Take care. Bye-bye.